Tom, the, the 1953-54 tour of the West Indies uh, was just at the start of a really great era for English cricket, arguably the, the best era ever, the, the 1950s, uh, and you were in the thick of it. Um, can you remember uh, what the, the feeling around the counties was in, in 1953 when England finally regained the Ashes? Well, I mean, that was a, a tremendous lift to everyone, and I was lucky enough to play in that match, or you know, in the series. And uh, cricket was rather like it was last year when we won the Ashes in, in 2005. You know, everybody was talking about cricket and uh, the whole game had a tremendous lift and England in those days were a very good side. And in fact, I think from losing to Australia in 51, we didn't lose another series until we went back to Australia in 58-9. And this tour was a case in point, but only just because uh, very England close. Were, were two down <laughs> After two test matches. That's right, that's right. We got away to a good start against Jamaica. Everybody got a few runs. And then uh, the first test match came up at Sabina Park. And one of the interesting things that happened was that uh, in the West Indian side was George Headley. The people of Kingston had gathered money together and sent it to George on condition he came over and they had to pick him actually in the in the match when he was past his best long way past his best and uh, in fact len gave him one off the mark in a test match which you don't associate with len really do you indeed <laughs> that that is incredible isn't it i was just it, it really was. These days. it really was remarkable and the first test they got they got well on top of us and uh, it, left us an enormous total to get. And in their second innings, Trevor had gone round the wicket, bowling down on the leg side to stop them scoring and getting too far ahead, which was not a good start to the series. And I, I think that had a great deal of bearing on the feeling between the teams. It, it wasn't looked on as cricket, and in those days, West Indians enjoyed their cricket, they had fun and uh, it went against the grain. Um, yes, yeah, so, uh, I mean, in Jim Swanton's book uh, on that tour, um, he, he pulls no punches um, in talking about the way that everyone began the, the, the tour in great hope and you know, a feeling of goodwill. Uh, and then he says, as the tour spent its length, beginning in Jamaica and continuing through each major colony until it ended where it opened, incident and misunderstanding followed steadily atop of one another until the original fabric of goodwill, despite much good and exciting cricket, had been ripped more or less to ribbons. Is that as you remember it? Yes, it wasn't a happy tour, that's for sure, and it, it all started at, at, in Jamaica, and we lost that test match quite easily. Uh, because Esmond Kentish, who was opening the bowling for West Indies, and he, he reverted to the same type of thing mm. and bowled down the leg side. And the whole game was ruined, really, and uh, a lot of bad feeling. Trevor had done that, had he not briefly, to save a, a game in the 53 series against Australia? At Headingley. At Headingley. I caught Graham Holard on the square leg boundary. Mm because what had happened, uh, they, uh, it was a, a miserable match. And Trevor went, what happened when they went in for the second innings, Len fancied that Lockie might do something and they rubbed the ball in the dirt. And Lockie opened the bowling mm. and he bowled like an absolute twit. You know, maybe it was the slippiness of the ball or whatever. And we looked as though we were going to give it away. And Trevor, I, I, you'll have to confirm this, Trevor said, give me the ball, I'll stop this nonsense. And he bowled down the leg side. I get the impression that Trevor was, was uh, um, in, in some ways, the brains of that side, or, or capable of becoming it if he felt that Len, well, Len was struggling. I, I think the thing was that Len had no experience of captaincy. Mm. And I also felt that he, he felt that a lot of the cricket writers did not want to have a professional captain taking a tour abroad. 
uh, and I don't think he had any help from there. But I think Trevor was the brains of the outfit, to be quite honest. Although Peter May became the heir apparent quite quickly, didn't yes, he? Yes, but Peter learned his captaincy from Len. Mm -hmm. So they were very similar in many ways. He's a fascinating character in himself, Len Hutton, isn't he? Oh, you, Quite inscrutable, really. You, well, that's right. He, he didn't say very much. And he, he was, uh, I mean, a fantastic player. And uh, because of that, everyone had respect for him. Mm. But uh, inexperience as a captain and not certain what to do, I think all led to a lot of ill feeling. Uh, my impression of Len Hutton, uh, because this was about the time that I was getting to learn about cricket, was that he was a superb technician, but a defensive player who felt the weight of the world on his shoulders. And yet I, I remember talking to John Woodcock about this and he was saying, no, he was the most wonderful attacking player by nature. Uh, that might have been before the war. Mm. But I think uh, that Len had to bear the brunt of the Australian attack after the war. Lindwall, Miller, Johnson, mm. you know, they came queuing up. Archer, Davidson. And Len took all the stick from that, and I don't think he ever forgot it. Mm. And he made that count when he got Australia on the other end of the stick in 1954-5. Mm. He really rubbed it in the dirt. But of course, England in this series in the West Indies had a, a, a big defeat at home in 1950 to, to avenge, really. That's right. That's uh, right. W what was the mood going out? I mean, did you think about cricket on the boat going out? Well, not a lot, because we'd had a long season, although we'd had the break and we didn't go out till, uh, I think, Boxing Day we left for the, uh, for the series. You did go uh, by sea, did you? No, you no. Flew? We flew to Bermuda, mm -hmm. flew to Bermuda, and had a week there, played a couple of games, and then went down to Jamaica, started the tour there. And of course we lost the first two. Um, Barbados, they had a streaky start. Uh, Brian Statham took a couple of wickets early on, and in the end they only got 390. And uh, of which Clyde Walcott got 220. That great big side screen in front of the pavilion, the concrete one, mm. he was hitting it against that and the ball was coming back into the middle. Oh. It was a massive innings. And they got into us early. And we lost, uh, we lost three wickets quickly. We were about 60 for three and I went in and I hit the first two from Ramadan firmly, mid off, mid on, yard either way, I'd have been eight not out. Uh, and Len came down the wicket to me and he said, uh, we don't want that, you know, we're, we've got to battle it out. So two hours later, I was caught and bowled Ramadan off a full toss for 15, mm. Mm. which uh, dented, dented out of it. But having said that, they declared and left us a total. And Dennis and I got in towards the end and we were going like trains and we we looked as though we might have a, an outside chance of winning. And he got an awful LBW decision. And the rest of the batting order collapsed, so we lost easily. Um, the rate of scoring between the two sides was significantly different, perhaps because of, because of Len's whole strategy of, of playing safety first. But uh, I mean, the, the West Indies, by nature, Yes, I, I, think, I think a lot of talk went on between the senior players after that second defeat and they decided we were going to play positive cricket. The program was we went to uh, British Guiana, mm. then we'd go up to Trinidad. But Trinidad was a no decision game. Because, it was because on you mat. played on a, a jute mat. Yeah. And it was, you, you got out when you got tired. It was sort <laughs> of one of those. Uh, uh, so we knew we had to win in British Guiana and then try and sort the uh, final test match out at Sabina Park. And yet, at, uh, at Georgetown in British Guiana, um, although you eventually 
made 435. It took two days, I think, to get it, if, if not just over. And, and on the first day, and I looked up, there were 106 overs bowled, which is 16 more than you get in a, a day's test cricket now. Uh, England made 153 for two. Yes, and I... Len Hutton not out. Yes. Yeah, it was slow stuff. But uh, that was Len. Yeah. And, and we played it that way, and we had a fantastic spell of quick bowling from Brian Statham, mm. who wrecked, wrecked the West Indian batting, got rid of them all, and we, we cantered home by ten wickets, by nine wickets. So the, me the, the means justified was justified it did, by yeah, the end. It did. Yeah. We had problem, a few problems with umpiring and that sort of thing, because uh, the two, the management objected to uh, one of the umpires at, at, who was going to stand in British Guiana and they replaced him with the groundsman hmm. who gave a run out decision which was absolutely right he was yes. out by a yard and a half and then we had a riot yeah the bottle throwing yes the bottle throwing and uh, was that, uh, they had the mounted police out and batons and everything. And was that alarming or amusing? Frightening. Or was it? Frightening. But what, a funny little story about that was that um, Derek de Serum, not no, Derek de Serum was Sing Singapore, uh, yeah, Ceylon. Ceylon. The president of the West Indian Board, I can't quite right. remember his yeah. name now, I'm sorry about that. He, he, he came out onto the field during the riot and said to Len, he said, Len, you ought to take your players off. Len turned around him and said, no, I want another wicket. Yeah, because you've <laughs> taken three quite quickly. We've taken three quite quickly. And I, I shall never forget it because the next man in was Sonny Ramadan. And as he walked behind the president, he said, and you can have mine if you bowl a straight one. <laughs> Because he was terrified. Was he? Oh, every, everybody was. Bottle throwing and everything. Mounted police. Whether it was political or not, I don't know, because uh, one of the politicians would, had been released from jail the, the day before. And uh, whether it was because of that or not. But uh, I mean, the run out decision was absolutely correct. So and I think, I think it upset both sides. Um, to what extent, I mean, who, you, you say politics might have come into it there, but, but who's to blame for this dissipation of the original goodwill? I mean, was it, was it, was it the umpires, was it? I think the umpires had quite a lot to do with it. Um, I know one of the, one of the umpires gave uh, a local hero out and they threw his father into the dock and somebody turned around and punched his wife in the eye. Hmm. So it was pretty electric stuff. Mm. Was that McWatt? McWatt, yeah, mm. Cliff McWatt. Tony Locke and, and Fred Truman famously didn't get their good conduct bonus at the end of the tour, did they? I no. think they got blamed for a few things that other people did. Right. When you lose the first two in a test series, I think everything becomes very, that much more important. Mm. And uh, as I said earlier, we had a chat afterwards, not the young people like me and myself and Peter May, but the senior players and said they'd got to get their heads down and uh, make something of it. Mm. And then of course we went to, went to uh, Queen's Park, Trinidad, they got 600 and something for nothing. We saved the follow-on. We got 540. And the, the game just fizzed out. And, and during that uh, innings of the West Indies, Fred hit Ferguson on the head. And he lay flat on the floor and Fred didn't take any notice of him. That oh. didn't uh, dress things up too well. It was a fantastic attack that England had in that oh. series, wasn't it? Uh, I mean, it, you know, it must be just, you had Truman Statham, uh, you had Lock and Laker, you had Johnny Wardle. And then, then in, the, in the last test match, we had Trevor Bailey. And, and of course, the Bailey. Uh, because <laughs> the amazing thing was, we got to Sabina Park to play the final test match, and uh, the groundsman said, it's the best wicket I've ever 
prepared in my life. And we were all saying, Len, you've got to win the toss. And he went out and he lost the toss. Mm. West Indies batted. And Trevor took seven for 38, I think. Something like that. There was just a little bit of juice. And it just moved about a bit. We went into bat. Len got 200. And uh, we beat him by, an by, by nine wickets. Um, Trevor's finest hour as a bowler, that? I would think so. He's done a few good things mm. in his life. I, I, he's a remarkable cricketer. I mean, in, in our day, we only ever batted with five batters, unless there was something really wrong. And Trevor came in six. So if a batter was there, he just hung about for another three or four hours <laughs> while the batter was getting the runs. And uh, he, he made the most of his ability and he was a tremendous cricketer. Godfrey Evans would then go in seven usually. Uh, seven and, and four bowlers. And four bowlers, uh, plus Bailey of course, as you say. But but um, Evans, uh, one of the best keepers has ever been. How would he compare as a batsman to the to the wicket keeper batsman that England try to pick these days? Well, he did get a couple of hundreds for England, didn't he? Mm. But he was, a, he was quite a character actually. I, I batted with him out here. When, uh, when he got 100 against India in 1952. And uh, there were two balls to go. Uh, Vinamanka took a wicket uh, in the last over. Two balls to go. So Vinu bowled the first two. Godfrey hit him for four. And I said, uh, I walked down the wicket. I said, good nick today, Godfrey. Yes, he had a good night last night. He said, <laughs> a good night last night. I said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to push for singles. You can have all the strike. And at lunch, he was 98 not out. Mm. <laughs> it was like a benefit match. It, and I imagine in the Caribbean, he didn't hold back off, off the field. Uh, you, you all he had didn't fun, hold sure. back off the field anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> he was uh, a wonderful character and a tremendous, tre tremendous team man. He had this great knack of being able to come off at tea time and go bang like that and sleep for 10 minutes. Mm. And he probably needed it, but you know, that was Godfrey. And he was, he was tremendous in the field. You know, he made everything look tidy. Mm. Never criticised the throw in and just got on with the game. Compo, he was the other big socialise in the side, was he? Well, we had one or two socialisers on the side. Uh, when you're in the Caribbean, it's, it's a wonderful atmosphere and feeling. And uh, But, uh, I, I mean, in those days, the cricketers knew what they could do and what they couldn't do. And the press were all cricket press. Mm. And providing you did your job on the field, not a thing was said. No. But if you did away, off the field. As long as you turned up fit, did your job, that ended with uh, Ian Botham, didn't it really? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, nowadays, of course, it's all sort of organised fitness and everybody has to you know, pass tests and things, but w how informal was it then? Was it up to you to get yourself oh, fit? You looked after yourself. You had your nets, hmm. but I, n I never saw anybody running round the ground and doing press-ups, stretch exercise. We might not have been the athletes they are now, but we were fit to play cricket. And cricket's a, I, I sort of liken it to uh, the present day setup. They're trained to run in the derby, but in fact they're taking part in the Grand National. Mm -hmm. You have to have a bit of lasting power, and that doesn't always come with athleticism. Would it be fair to say, though, that you got a bit more respite in between? Well, we played an awful lot of cricket. Uh, I mean, I remember playing here against Australia in 53. Oh, no, the, the final test match of the Oval. And the following day, we were playing Australia at Bristol. Mm. We travelled, <coughs> excuse me, we travelled Tuesday or Friday, and we, we played Sometimes I had 55 innings in a season. So we were never off the field. Mm. And just playing the game 
kept us fit. Mm. We had our good Saturday nights, and uh, then Sunday off, played 36 hours of golf, and then ready for cricket again. But sometimes a benefit match as well. A benefit match as well. Mm. Uh, but on tour, what was what was the, the base of it? Did, did you get days off? Oh yes, yes. Mm. I, I mean, and, uh, on that West Indian tour, they asked me to play in the Jamaican Open golf tournament. <laughs> but once we lost the first test match, that didn't take place. <laughs> what a shame. <laughs> You might have had that on your uh, CV as well. Um, <laughs> then we were, well, I say we went to Sabina Park. And Trevor bowled magnificently. Uh, Len got his 200. And one incident with, uh, with the Prime Minister of, of Jamaica. Len came off the field and the Prime Minister went to speak to him and Len, who, having batted six hours, was in a daze, just walked past him. And they sort of set, set up something that he'd insulted the Prime Minister and this, that and the other, which didn't help at all. So... Uh, you, it you, went you, right through. Yeah. You've mentioned the umpiring as being one of the reasons. Yeah. But, but misunderstanding seems to have been some of it otherwise. A lot of it, yes. And, and, and of course, probably people don't remember, but Gary Sobers, playing for Barbados, came in as a 17-year-old, got a few runs, and Lockie was on, and he let one go. The old-fashioned Chuck. Right. Which knocked all three out. And the square leg umpire no ball in for throwing. This, the square leg umpire was Clyde Walcott's uncle. <laughs> <laughs> but he, I, I mean, Lockie cured that in the end. Mm. But uh, what was the reaction of the rest of the team then? I mean, did, did, did you? All we had a bit of a laugh about, about it actually. Did you? It was only about his colony game. Mm. And then Gary Sobers and made course, his test debut. He made his test debut. Came in at batting at number nine, playing instead of uh, Alf Valentine, yeah. fantastic cricketer, and uh, became the best cricketer I've ever seen. Valentine, however, had done pretty darn uh, well, had he not? He got a race to 100 wickets, I think, right. quicker than Bill O'Reilly. And, and he and Ramadan um, carried all before them in 1950, but not really so much in this series. No, we worked it out, actually. <coughs> it was very difficult to pick. A ram, mm -hmm. but if the sun was in the right place, if you looked at the ball, you could see which way these, the the seam was going. So I remember that doing that in 1950 up at uh, Cheltenham when they bowled us out for 80 twice. But if the sun was in the right place, you could see the which way the ball was going. And what had also happened, which happened in 57, was a lot of the English batting. They used their pads. Mm. They stuck the old pad down the wicket and put it behind, put their bat behind it. And uh, I was sitting across the road one day, and Ramadan and Valentine were at the bar, and we talked about. It and eventually, it got back to the '57 series. And uh, Ram said, "Yeah," he said, "Peter May, he played magnificently." He said. But I had Colin Cowdery out 87 times OBW. <laughs> <laughs> because he wasn't playing a shot. But that he wasn't playing a shot. But that then was not the law, was it? I want to think. Well, if you don't hit the ball with a bat and you're in line, you yeah, should yeah. be given out. Well, if you're in line, indeed. But uh... he didn't spin it a lot. No. But he spun his leg spinner more than his off spinner. And, uh, and he was very difficult to pick. And of course, as he said about five years ago, he threw every one. He certainly looks suspicious and still frame. Well, that's why he, that's why he had his sleeves rolled yeah. down. So did he did he throw his off spinner more than his? No, he threw them both. 
I remember at Trinidad on that flat wicket, he bowled a bouncer and a beamer the last two balls before lunch mm. off his little run. He wasn't, as I remember, as, as big a spinner of the balls as, say, Moretheran, who's, who's another, oh, no. another no, fairly no. unique bowler. No, he didn't spin it that way, but uh, Moretheran has got such an accentuated delivery mm. that he can actually spin it so much, mm. he can turn it on a flat one. But of course it can be just as difficult to bat against if it's only turning just enough to get the Of course, the of course. He prefers bowling on flat wickets, mm -hmm. I'm sure, and doesn't like having to go around the wicket. No. As for English batting at that time, it was a fascinating period because you had Hutton and Compton both made their names before the war. And Peter came in. And then yourself and Peter May, and then just around the well, corner. I wouldn't Colin put Cargill. myself in that class. I was a little bit behind Peter May. You scored a lot of hundreds, Tom. Well, that was neither one though, the thing or the other, but uh, Peter, I think, probably with Graham Gooch, the best post-war batters I played with. So you're, you're excluding Hutton and Compton from that? No, no, they can, they're pre-war. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And, uh, and of all the others, I mean, there was... There was ten, well, we had, we had a lot of good Cody. players. There was Kenny Barrington, Colin Cowdery, Ted Dexter. Uh, there, there were a lot of good players, but I, I, I was uh, the first sort of five or six years that I played for England. I, I was, you know, shunted around a bit. I mean, I wasn't in the same street as those other players at that stage. And. Uh, when, the, when there was a fill-in, I, I did it, sort of thing. Uh, like the final test match, well, the final test match in Australia, at Sydney, in 54-5. I mean, I didn't even know I was playing when Len went out to toss. And we'd picked 13. And we'd had terrible rain. And uh, we didn't start until lunchtime on the fourth day of a six-day match. Mm -hmm. And as Len came in having tossed, and Ian Johnson won the toss and uh, put us in, because there was no hope really. And uh, as he walked past me, Len said, Tom, put your pads on and come in with me. And that was the first time I knew I was playing. Mm -hmm. That was his, his style, was it really? I mean, did he... Did well, you, you, you never knew whether Len was taking the mickey or not. He was a little bit like that. Mm. But uh, what a player. What a player. If, if you'd had to have anyone batting for your life, would it have, would it have been Hutton? Of, 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 of all the players you've played with and against? I think I'd pick Sobers. Would you? I'd mm -hmm. pick him, because he could do everything. Mm. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing about so was he batted number six once he got in charge. He batted higher up the order, but I mean, from number six, he dictated which way the match was going. Mm. And had you spotted the player that he became when you played against him at Sabina Park that first time? Oh, yeah. yeah. He, he had everything. Timing. And, and being absolutely honest about the thing was that when I played later against Gary, and I can speak for most of the English batsmen, they were delighted if Gary got few runs, because it meant he wouldn't take the new ball. Because you can have Wes and Charlie, very great bowlers, but Gary Sobers with the new ball mm. was one of the most dangerous of all. Late in swing. Boycott, mm. and Trent Bridge, <laughs> first over. <laughs> Fantastic. Mm. Uh, the three W's were still at, oh. still at their best in this. Yes, series. they were. They were. We, we, <laughs> of those three, would you care to put them in any order? I don't think you can separate them. I, I think uh, 
probably Frank was the, the most brittle of the three. Uh, when Brian bowled at him, he didn't seem to know where he was. Brian Statham. St Brian used to get him out. Everton is still a fantastic man and a great, 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 great man. And Clyde, of course. Mm. As I mentioned the two hundred. <coughs> excuse me. I mentioned the two hundred and twenty at Barbados. Well, it, uh, on that uh, Trinidad, Jute, Matt, Everton got two hundred and eight. Frank got 167, and Clyde Walcott was 124 not out. Mm. So we did a bit of leather chasing that day. <laughs> <coughs> and then you, you really, I suppose, the, the worth of the bowlers came out, uh, and you had Truman and Statham, too, the, the greatest we've oh, ever had. Right. And you had, uh, I'm interested in a comparison between Truman and Statham and also between Locke and Wardle who were sort of vying for the left armers. Well, the, 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 on tour, the great advantage of having Johnny Wardle was he'd bowl his Chinaman and Googly. Mm -hmm. And it was astonishing how many people didn't pick him. I mean, he bowled, when we made Australia follow on in 55, he came on and bowled his Chinaman and Gould, and they didn't know whether it was Christmas or Easter. He bowled beautifully, and he also bowled his Chinaman and Googlies in the West Indies mm. on that tour. Gary Sobers didn't learn that art from him, did he? I don't think so. I mean, Gary just did everything totally naturally. Mm. So Never used his pad in defence. He played with the bat. Yeah. So, I mean, on, on a flat pitch, on a hot day, you, you would have taken Wardle ahead of Locke, would you? Yeah, yeah, I would. Definitely, definitely. It's more more versatile. And of course, it, it was, with Gary, if he got in on a flat wicket, that's where we set him up mm. in 66, on the flattest pitch at the Oval, which, and they are flat. And we'd got a lot of runs, and he, he'd, he'd given it away when he got 80 in the first innings. And uh, I, I said to uh, Closey, I said, if he gets in on this wicket second innings, he'll fly us to death. And we had a little get together with John Snow. And Snowy, when the wicket fell, Snowy was bowling, and he was going to give him the bounce the first ball. And he bowled an absolute beauty, just pitching just outside the leg stump and coming on to him. And Gary just accepted the challenge, which he always did. And close, he was at short leg. He was almost in Gary's pocket. And the old bat went <laughs> And close, he never moved. Just got a glove on it, he picked it up. Otherwise, that might have been a very long day. Because there's nothing new under the sun. I, 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 I noticed from reading E.W. Swanton's account of one of those test matches in 53-4 that uh, Dennis Compton had skippered, I think, in the previous match and come up to silly mid-off and Walcott had got out and Len did the same thing in the test match. That's right, that happened. That happened and, and, and Clyde, got an, <coughs> Clyde got an inside edge and, uh, from Brian. Brian took those three wickets quickly and uh, it, it, well, it turned the whole tour, to be quite honest. And then Johnny bowled his Chinaman and Googlies. And we finished all square. And it was a tough series. And I think we deserved to square it in the end. And a great recovery because... Oh, a tremendous recovery. Mm. Tremendous. I think that's a nice finish to get to Australia. Got yeah, one. yeah. Right. <laughs> um, Australia... Uh, 54-5, England in the rare position of holding the ashes, That's right. having regained them in 53. Um, there were one or two slightly odd selections. Fred Truman was left behind. That's right, that's right, which is amazing, really. But I, I, think, I think we picked 18 players mm -hmm. to start with, which was top-heavy. But that was only because Dennis had a wonky knee and I think the selectors were frightened he might break down and therefore they took an extra batter which was Vic Wilson 
who was a fantastic fielder as well as, as, as a useful left-hander. Uh, and we, we were top-heavy. It was hard work getting everybody to have a game. Can you remember, was there a lot of controversy about Truman being left at home and, and Frank Tyson, who was a bit of an unknown quantity, starting Well, I think to... Frank had bowled against the Australians in 53 at Trent Bridge, at uh, Northampton, hadn't he? Mm. And he'd slipped three out until Neil Harvey got on to him and sorted him out. So word had got round about that, had it? Yes. Mm. Oh, yeah. And, and when we, by the time we, by the time we played our preliminary matches and got to the first test at, uh, at Brisbane, I must mention our stopover in, uh, in Salon. We played a couple of one-day games and during the, our stay there, Alec picked up shingles. Alec Bedzer, who'd helped to win the Ashes, fantastic performance in 53, and so he wasn't really fit. And by the time we'd played a few of the state games and the Australian 11 and got up to uh, Brisbane, I still didn't think he was fit. But I mean, it was nothing to do with me. And Len and the selectors had decided to pick four quick bowlers. Alec, Brian Statham, Frank Tyson and Trevor Bailey. And if we won the toss, we were going to put them in. Which we won the toss and put them in and they got 601 for eight. Godfrey wasn't keeping wicket. He uh, got a cold or something where, which he, could, he couldn't keep wicket. So Good. Keith Andrew kept wicket, which might have made a difference. But uh, they just came out and slaughtered us. I think Frank Tyson took one for 140. 160, I think. 160, yeah. was it? And somewhere between that test match, losing it so badly, and playing the second one at Sydney, um, whether it was half Gover or, or it might even have been Ray Lindwall, had a word with Frank and he shortened his run and we were, before the test match, we were playing uh, Victoria and Frank ran in off this shorter run and he was just terrifying. He did all three Harveys and somebody in the ground shouted, why don't they bowl him a piano and see if he can play that? Mm. But, you know, he was absolutely devastating. That was Neil Harvey and his two that brothers. Neil Harvey and his two brothers. Mm. So they come to picking the test match side. Obviously, Dennis is out, so I take Dennis's place. And this is where a little bit of inexperience came from Len instead of going to Alec and talking to him and saying, look, we're, we don't think you're 100% fit, we're going to leave you out. Instead of doing that, the team sheet went up and Alec had to look at that. A little bit of man management, really, mm. that's all it was. <clears throat> but I, I, I think it, it certainly upset Alec. Do you think Len was just embarrassed to have to I tell don't, him. I don't think he knew that he should have done it. So it, it was unfortunate because uh, Alec never really played again after that. No, and he'd been the pillar of the bowling oh, since absolutely. the war. Absolutely, he carried carried it. And with all due respect to the other fast bowlers that had joined him, he was a one-man band really. How quick was Alec Benson? Quicker than everybody thought. He was such a big man, had a beautiful run up and got sideways on and and he hit the deck. He was fast, fast medium. They all classed him as a fast medium bowler, mm. but he was he hit the bat hard. So keeping up to the stumps as he liked his wicketkeepers to do was, well, that's was right. remarkable really. 
fantastic. I mean, Godfrey, uh, Arthur McIntyre kept at Surrey. He was a brilliant keeper. And uh, then when we went in 58, Roy Swetman mm. went on, was on the tour. But uh, Godfrey was brilliant behind the stumps. He used to stump people off Alec. Wonderful, mm. wonderful bowler. And, and, and Alec had a, 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 a little sign on Arthur Morris. He used to get Arthur Morris out regularly. Mm. And for that matter, Don Bradman. So yeah. it was it was tough for Alec to take, mm. but uh, uh, and it was just a slip of lens. Uh, it, it wasn't there was no animosity about it. It was just the way he worked mm. and the, the way it happened. You say that he probably certainly in retrospect shouldn't have been picked for that first Test match. But who actually picked the team? Was it Len entirely or no? Len Den uh, Dennis was involved. Um, Jeffrey Howard. Yeah, the manager. Brilliant manager. Best manager of all. Did it all himself. And he managed the... Uh, he managed the tour I went, the first tour I went on, India, Pakistan and Ceylon, which is a tough one to do, mm. without a baggage man. Uh, but uh, Jeffrey Howard had quite a lot to do with it. So we go to the second test match. wasn't a good wicket and uh, we struggled I think uh, I, I played reasonably well I got 21 I think out of a low total about 160 or 170 and then Frank came and uh, he had a 40 mile an hour gale blowing mm. behind him from the Ranrick Road end and he'd shortened his run and he got it absolutely spot on, and he was terrified. They didn't, they just didn't fancy him. Mm. We knocked him over for nothing, really. And then in the second innings, uh, Peter and Colin got runs. I got a quick naught. And uh, then in the second innings, we just bowled him out again. Brian, Brian stayed there. Frank got a lot of the plaudits. I think he took seven for 40 or something like that. But Brian bowled into that 40 mile an hour gale. I think he bowled tw something like 28 ball overs, took three for 39, mm. which is, you know, I mean, I know there wasn't much of him, but having to bowl into that. And, and he was, uh, you know, he was the anchor man, really. Tyson, six for 85, actually. Oh. Yeah. But I know uh, Richard Benno always says that that was the quickest bowling he ever faced. Yes. And Don Bradman said that. He, the quickest he'd ever seen. Mm. And it, it was. I, I was at slip, and I was 50 yards back. Mm. I was nearer the gate to go off the ground than I was to the batsman. Incredible. Were you hoping the ball would come to you? Or? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got over my nerves because yeah. I was made a, a close catcher on the West Indian uh, tour and uh, I stayed at slip for the rest of my life nearly. Mm. Uh, you say the pitch wasn't very good and I'm struck by the low scoring in that series. Well, there was I no think only three batsmen on, on both sides got over 300 runs in the series. Apart, apart from the first match, there was hardly any runs about. Mm. And I mean, I, I, uh, I mean, I got a hundred in the last one, and ended up top of the averages, and they'd won it before I played. Mm. What well, I mean was that pitches, or was it outstanding bowling, or what? I think Len and Dennis were getting near the end, but in their place you had Peter May and Colin Cowdery had a fantastic tour for a first tour, and he. He came out as, uh, you know, an up-and-coming, mm. but played in all the test matches and played well. He got a hundred in... Uh, Melbourne? A hundred in Melbourne on a terrible wicket. A hundred, uh, I think he got a hundred and four out of about a hundred and eighty, hundred and seventy, hundred and eighty. And during that test match, it was, uh, the groundsman was called House, I think. And when we left the ground on the Saturday, 
there were cr cracks that wide in the pitch. And when we went out and looked at the pitch on Monday morning, there weren't any cracks. And the temperature on the Sunday had been 104. Mm -hmm. So we wondered where the cracks had gone. Well, we're, um, we all know why they'd gone. I yes. will mention it in a second. But were the, were the pitches covered um, overnight? Oh, yes. Yes, yes. yes. They were all yeah. covered overnight. But uh, that was Percy if, Beam's uh, great story, wasn't it? The journalist yeah, who, right. who actually went there on the rest day and saw the ground being watered. Saw yeah. the pitch being watered. They watered the pitch in the middle of the, gra middle of the game. <laughs> it's a good job we won. Mm. Otherwise, it'd have been an awful. Did it? Did it actually change the nature of the pitch? Yeah. Well, it did. It did, because everybody was saying, "Why, why, why didn't Ian Johnson bowl on the Monday?" So because the wicket wasn't any good for me, <laughs> <laughs> which it had been. Because mm. uh, I mean, Colin got out to a ball that pitched two feet outside the off stump, and he'd just gone across to cover his wicket, and he bowled it behind his legs. Oh. Mm. It was a road. It was unusual to get these such sporting wickets in Australia, was it not? Well, it was. I, 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 normally speaking, they, they, they're good pitches, but there was always a bit of grass about and mm. something around. I mean, Adelaide was the best wicket we batted on after that. Um, we won in Melbourne, won in Sydney, and then... Uh, Wrapped it up in Adelaide. Wrapped it up in Adelaide. Where Bob Appleyard? Bob, Bob, uh, I, I remember the headline in uh, Bill O'Reilly's, uh, Bill O'Reilly's paper. He'd written, uh, he'd written his piece, and the headline was, "Look out for Statham," uh -huh. and he didn't get on. <laughs> Bob Appleyard did the three M's, didn't he? He, he did Maddox, Miller, and. McDonald, right, and uh, he bowled superbly. He had this very high action, spun the ball almost, uh, uh, almost the same pace as Don Shepherd used to bowl it. They were off cutters, but he spun it so much, and he he made the ball bounce like a tennis ball, and. You know, from there, we, 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 we were in charge. We, mm. we just out general them. And they didn't, fancy, they didn't fancy Frank. So you always had that, or then always had that ace up his sleeve. That That's right. Mm. That's right. Best, best uh, bowling attack you ever played with, it, uh, home or away, would you say that one? Pretty useful. Yeah, that's right, because Johnny was there as well. Johnny, Johnny Wardle. He's, it was a beautifully balanced side, actually, you know, and, and, and there were batters waiting to come in that didn't mm. get a game. I mean, Red Simpson only played once. And you only played at the end? I only played twice. And then uh, suddenly everything turned for me when I, when I got the 100, uh, and I became an opening batter, mm. which wasn't a very good idea because we played South Africa the following <laughs> year. <laughs> I mean, and Adcock. <laughs> But uh, I mean, but then, it was it was it, from Brisbane on. It was a fantastic tour, and the Australians. I like Australians, and I get on well with them. And that hundred that I got actually had a funny ending to it. I'd had a poor tour, you know, to all intents and purposes. And then Len asked me to go in with him first, and Peter and I had a big stand. And I got to uh, 85, and Keith came on from uh, the round again, and I hit him for four through cover, straight, wide of it on, to get me to 97. And he bowled me the slowest long hop down the leg side possible, without a fine leg, mm -hmm. and I missed it. So he did it again, oh, really? and I got a hundred. And that was Keith Miller's generosity. And that's generosity. the sort of Keith Miller. Fantastic man, and Ray Lindell was the same, but mostly Aussies. 
were good blokes. Alan Davidson, Ron Archer, Bill Johnson, all wonderful cricketers and wonderful men. Do you think Miller would have done that to you if uh, England had still needed 30 to win the Ashes, if it hadn't all been decided? I don't think he would have. <laughs> I don't think he would. There's but a limit. Another interesting thing about Keith Miller, when we went to uh, India, Pakistan, Ceylon, they suddenly brought a Commonwealth side over, which was a world eleven. Mm. Miller, Harvey and Hole, Mankad and uh, Imtiaz Ahmed, Fuzzle Mahmood, you know, it was a, and three from Ceylon. Mm -hmm. I got North in the first innings. I go out in the second innings and uh, somebody got out quickly and I, I was number three. And I, Keith bowled me a bounce and I went to pull it and I was a little bit early and just flicked my glove and as it was going down the leg side, before the ball got to the wicket keeper, Keith Miller said, not out. And he only said it because he wanted to see me bat he knew I'd be playing against them next year. Mm. And I got 40 or something, but Keith Miller. When you, when you finally clinched the ashes at, at Adelaide, you actually, um, with only 90 odd to get in the fourth innings, got into a bit of early trouble, didn't you? Yes, we certainly did, because Keith Miller had a fantastic opening spell. He took three, I think we were 18 for three, was it as low as that? And then, uh, Peter came in. Peter, st Peter was still in there. And uh, Len almost lost it. He said, he's done us. He's huh. done us. We wanted, I think we wanted 111 to win or something like that. And the strange thing happened. That Richie came on and Peter was going well. He'd got about 30 odd, I think. And he hit this one low into the covers. And Keith dived and he shielded the batsman's view of the catch. And when he rolled back over, the ball was on the ground, but Peter had already walked. So and nothing happened. So Peter just carried on walking and it was one of those strange things. Keith may have put it down, but I'm sure he wouldn't have cheated. Did he get a bit jittery in the dressing room? Very. Uh, but Len was the worst. Len was, you know, he really, I, th I think the pummeling he'd taken from Australia after the war, I don't think he ever really got over it. No. And he, when he had the Statham and Tyson combination. He really rubbed it into the Aussies. And can you remember his reaction when the Ashes were safely won again? Was he was he elated or was he? Oh, calm? absolutely. Was he absolutely? It meant more to everybody, did it, in the England team than any other series win? Well, it always does. I mean, you beat Australia. That's that's the thing. And uh, I played in six series, not every match, but in parts, and we won three, drew two, and only lost one, the 58 series, mm. which was a pretty nasty series anyhow. Everybody says of your innings, at, uh, who saw it at, at, uh, in, in the, that last test match, that it was one of the most beautiful hundreds that's, that's been made in the Ashes, uh, and, and yet you at other times didn't crack it against Australia. So it's the I think sort of... I, I think early in my career, I was a boy amongst men, and uh, all I I could never say anything about it. People would say, "Oh, he's got a terrible temperament. When the chips are down, it's he always lets us down, and this, that, and the other." And I'd never been able to say anything about it until I got back in the side and, and did well mm. at the end of my career. Uh, and uh, I, I just, cricket has always been a game to me.
and irrespective of the circumstances or anything else, I always played it as a game. And you can't help the way you are. No, and also luck plays a much bigger part well, every, than people every, recognise, doesn't Every it? time I hit the ball that high off the deck against Australia, some idiot put a hand out and it went straight in. Mm. I can remember Neil Harvey catching me a couple of times. <laughs> Absolute blinders in the dark, mm. you even called them. And uh, it, it's just one of those things. And I, I never really did justice to myself against Australia. But it's horses for courses, whereas the West Indies, I used to smash them all over the park. Yeah. And, but, and do you consciously remember being more confident batting against the West Indies because you'd scored against them, and vice versa? I, I, I went out cheerfully every time to bat, and if it came off, I was happy. Mm. But uh, I was never conscious. I, I was conscious at the end that I hadn't done very well against Australia. So, in fact, it, it was 1968 series was the best I had against mm. Australia when I was 40, oh, 40. 41, mm. 42, yeah. Um, so it was, you didn't feel a building pressure for that reason, I did felt, you, sometimes? I, I, I suppose, summing it up, I felt that I wasn't given the responsibility. And maybe it was a changeover from Gloucester to Worcester, but I had the responsibility there, and we won the championship twice. And when I played in the 66 series against the West Indies here, I felt I was the best player in the side, and I played that way. Mm. You, uh, you mentioned Len Hutton saying, cool it, you know, don't play so many strikes he, in the West Indies, but he did it to you at Lords. He did it to me here career. in 1953. Um, Don Kenyon got out early. I think we were nine for one, and I went in. And uh, it was the last ball of the over. Uh, Ray Lindwell did Don Kenyon. And Keith Miller's running in from the uh, pavilion end with a brand new ball. And the first ball he bowls to me is a googly. Oh. <laughs> a full toss googly. And I hit it wide in mid on. And Len thought it was going for four. And it went all up the, and stopped that far from uh -huh. the pavilion rails. And we, we got a single out of it. Anyway, we settled down and we were knocking them all over the place. And uh, at about, just before six o'clock, Len came down the wicket and he said, look, we don't want to lose a wicket tonight. So just, uh, and really, both of us should have got a hundred that night. And in the end, we went off. We were 176 for one. And Ray Lindrell bowled me out third ball the following morning. Mm. So uh, I think Len had a, a safety streak in him, a play play safe, which I I didn't really. Yeah. But yeah. I had to do what I was told. Of course, that was—I mean—that was bred into everybody, wasn't it? Not least because of the war, I suppose. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Because he always said to me, Len, that he was a far better player before the war than after the war, because he, he lost an inch and a half off his arm, didn't mm. he? Um, Australia, socially, uh, um, it was a very long tour, wasn't it? As they were in those days. Fantastic, fantastic. They couldn't do enough for us. Especially when Trevor hit the, was the only man to hit a six in 50, 54 at Brisbane. And he won a hundred pounds. Right. And he put it behind the bar. And a hundred pounds is a lot of money in those days. <laughs> but you saw it off. Was that at the hotel or was that on the ground? I think we went everywhere. <laughs> but uh, as I say, we were, we were sensible people. We, we knew what condition we should be on when we mm. played, and I played all my life that way. 